Hello, everybody. Hello. Ladies, gentlemen, and fine folks who identify as neither. Nice to see you all. It's a wonderful, beautiful other CypherCon. I uh, actually gave one of my very, very early talks at CypherCon 1, and it was not this impressively organized and engineered, so this is pretty exciting for me. I still have some people filtering in. Hello, friends. So, uh, if we haven't met, and I, I think I've met most of you, but there's a couple new faces here. Uh, my name is Leslie Carhart, and what do I do for a living? I, uh, I do incident response for very unique systems, uh, industrial control systems to be specific. So, when something like a power plant gets hacked, or a water treatment plant, or um, manufacturing, even trains, my team is some of the few folks in the world who go out and try to figure out what happened and try to keep it from happening again in the future. I work for a company called Dragos, and that's all we do is industrial stuff. And I've been doing incident response for a pretty long time now. Um, I've been in IT for over 20 years now. I've been in IR and, and Differ for, well, like 12, 13 years. Um, and I speak about this stuff a lot. I blog about it and I tweet and TikTok and everything prolifically about cybersecurity. Sorry about that. Um, I retired from the United States Air Force Reserves in December, so after 21 years. And in my free time, I teach small people to hit things in martial arts. So what are we going to talk about? Uh, we just had a really, really interesting keynote on a completely different technical topic. Um, and I just want to take us back to the beginning and, and talk a little bit about jobs in cybersecurity. Because it's something I get asked about a lot. I get asked about, um, you know, different things that people could do in cybersecurity. And a lot of times, young people come up to me and they're like, well, I want to get into cybersecurity. And then I ask them, well, what do you want to do? And they're like, I, I don't know, what should I do? And that's a really a, a complicated topic. I ended up writing a very long blog series about this. It's been passed around the internet for a while. And, um, you know, in, in the beginning, we, you know, we try to figure out whether people want to go the more offense, so the, the red team route, or the more defense, the blue team route. And they're both very, very valid, and they're both interesting careers. But the bottom line is there is so much going on in cybersecurity that it's, it's difficult to learn everything in one niche, right? And um, to learn two niches is a lot, and you, you just can't learn it all. And uh, it's good to shadow other career fields in cybersecurity and learn a little bit about them. We talk about like purple teaming, um, and, and that's an, an awesome concept I'll, I'll talk a little bit about later, but in the end, you can only fit so much in your brain. So you kind of have to focus in cybersecurity. And uh, people just, they aren't sure where they want to go. So sometimes they hop around a little bit. Sometimes they try to start in a job that gives them exposure to a lot of different things. But today I want to talk to you about selecting a role and which one might be interesting for you specifically. Um, and how do we do that right now? Well, you might come up to a person like me and be like, what job should I get? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know you. Um, what do you want to do? Um, so we usually make those decisions based on, well, first of all, what we think is cool. So maybe what we see on TV or at conference talks or we hear about in our classes. You know, there's, there's these like prototypical hackers out there, right? You know, and uh, I'm kind of prototypical, so I'm sorry about that. But, you know, um, we see this, this idealized image of uh, these various roles in cybersecurity, especially things like pen dusting. Like, yeah, you're breaking into stuff, you're hacking things, it's really, really cool. Um, and you also hear about things that are talked about in your circle. So maybe you're at CypherCon today and you go to a talk and you hear about something that sounds really neat and you're like, oh, I want to do that when I grow up. And that happens to me all the time. I want to be like 14 more things when I grow up. Um, and you see, you see a view of things from the outside. So you see kind of a, a view of how you perceive things from a limited image, okay? And, uh, it really depends a lot on what you personally are exposed to, what you end up deciding to do, and that can be based on kind of a false image, right? Because we see these idealized temporary images of these various niches in cybersecurity. So let's talk a little bit about you all. So I want you to think about yourselves for a moment. I want you to do a lot of introspection during this talk, but let's, let's think about um, 
ways that we kind of characterize ourselves. So if you work for a large company, you will oftentimes run into team dynamic models. So you go and you take your little personality test, maybe tells you what color you are or something, or you know what set of letters or things that you, you are based on their, their exam. And hey, these, these models, they, they try to put people in boxes, with, which never really works. Um, like we, we talk about uh, Myers-Briggs and stuff, and we say it's like, um, Ferinology for HR, things like that. It's 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 just kind of artificial, and you really can't put people into a box like that. Um, however, models that talk about various aspects of personality can be useful to understand things about yourself and the people that you work with. They are a tool. They are not a magical thing that's going to assign your your sorting hat assignment to something. Like that's that's not what's going to happen there. You you'll get some ideas about how you might differ from other people who are doing a similar job or a different job. And so we're going we're gonna to use some of these models today, and I don't want you to get hung up on them. They're all, everything's a spectrum in the world. People are com complicated, people change over time. If you do one of these personality tests today, um, in, in a year you might come back and, and be characterized completely differently by the same test, because we change, our lives change, we change. Um, and so, so we really can't be put into a box like that. But um, as I said, to talk about some of these roles and who might like them and who might not like them, I'm going to use some of these as a tool. So, so let's start at a high level. Stuff to consider about yourself. So introspection time, think about this for a moment. So your attention span. This is an important factor, right? Some of these jobs I'm gonna talk about today I'm going to talk about things that, that are exciting to certain personality types, and I'm going to talk about things that are often considered negatives, so the downsides of the jobs. Um, now, some people might disagree with me on that, because I have a personality of my own. I ended up in a specific niche of cybersecurity, and thankfully there are people who are very, very different from me, who think some of the stuff I find very, very boring is pretty exciting. That said, there are always mundane parts of every cybersecurity role, okay? Everyone has stuff that we rarely see in talks because even the people who really love their work agree that that part is kind of dull and frustrating and time-consuming and boring. It's the nature of almost every job in cybersecurity, and we're going to talk about a whole bunch of them. Um, so your attention span, how long can you focus on a single thing? And, um, you know, is that a short period of time? Or can you focus on one task for days at a time and be really happy? And then there's introversion versus extroversion. And all the area in between the two. How much do you like dealing with humans? All right? So some of you are really outgoing and really like talking to people and meeting people. And some of you really would like to be a little bit more isolated in your work. And then there's balances between the two. There's people who like to go out and meet people and then need time to recharge. So they're, they're somewhere on the introvert side, side of things, but they're a little bit further towards extroverts. So that can really play into where you're going to be happy as a job as well. Um, analytical versus creative thinkers. Again, it's a spectrum. You can be a little bit of both. Um, but again, something to consider. Your patience. Do you get frustrated easily? How about with people? How about with people you're teaching? How about with things that are not concrete? I run into this a lot in cybersecurity. People who get tremendously frustrated because the thing they're doing in cybersecurity doesn't have a concrete conclusion or concrete finding. The answer is fuzzy. And some people really can't take that, okay? Empathy and emotional intelligence for both nefarious and good reasons. We'll talk about some of these roles where that's a really important thing and it's a useful skill. And it can also be a negative in, in some of these cases as well. Willingness to travel and work non-standard hours, that can be considered a negative in a lot of jobs if you're on the road all the time in them. Your writing and presenting skills, we'll talk about these a lot. It's not something that makes a lot of the YouTube DEF CON talks. It, it's just not something that we bring up a whole bunch. However, it is a really huge element of a lot of the job roles we'll, we'll talk about today, okay? And finally, your reaction to stressful situations. Do you like be up, being up in front of a big audience and giving a talk, or is that like your idea of a nightmare? <laughs> I see some of you cringing right now. 
See, I, th I think this is fun. I see all my friends, they've got sparkly badges and things, but some people don't think that's cool. So let's talk about a few of these so-so models that we can use to, to talk about people. So the first one I'm gonna introduce you to is Curtin's Adapter Innovator Model. So this model is, it assumes the following. It, it, the, it hypothesizes the following, that everybody ends up on a spectrum between adapters and innovators. See, your adapters are people who like to take something that exists already and change it to do something new. So this is kind of a hacker mentality sometimes, like find something that does one thing and make it better or change it to do something different. So that's pretty cool, right? But on the other side of this, there's innovators. And the innovators are people who like to kind of throw things out, burn them down, and start from scratch. And I bet if you think about this for a moment, if you work on a team in school or at work, you run into situations where those two things butt heads. It oftentimes happens between like technical people, creative people, and salespeople, or executives, finance people. This is something that people butt heads on a lot, is whether to fix something that exists or burn it down and start over. And again, this is a spectrum. You can be in the middle of it. You can be comfortable with both. That's fine, but that can cause conflicts individually and as teams. Learning styles. So we generally talk about three types of learners, okay? And people usually fall into two, one or two of those categories. So first of all, there's visual learners. They like to see, they're, they're staring at the screen right now, and uh, they, they like to look at the PowerPoint. They like to learn by looking at things. Um, auditory learners, they are the ones who are listening to my words right now. Thank you very much, auditory learners. I appreciate that. Um, and uh, that's how they like to learn. They like to listen to podcasts. That's, that's useful to them. Uh, they can listen to like on-demand training and things like that and really learn from it. And finally, there's kinesthetic learners. And I'm, I'm, I fall into this category, the people who like to do things to learn them. So to, to learn a new task, they want to hands on keyboard, do the task, and that's how they learn things. That's how things stick. Maybe they have to take notes, write things down during a lecture to actually memorize it. So people usually fall into one or two of those categories and don't like the third. But that's not everybody. Now let's get on to William Marston. Um, Marston created one of the early team dynamic models for personalities, okay? Um, he also happened to create a, a comic I like very much, Wonder Woman. He had a varied and, and obscure career. Um, and uh, it goes like this. There's, there's different categories, elements, that we divide people into. And it ends up that we end up somewhere on this Circlical, uh, circular, um, cyclical uh, map of personality traits and types. So let's, let's talk about them really quickly, and I want you to think about where you might fall in here. Again, this is not scientific, it's not a be-all, end-all, it might change tomorrow, but... So we have the challenger. So the challenger is very competitive. They are a high expectation person, they're a good leader. They like to ask critical questions, they like to get into the fray and lead the situation, very type A kind of person. You have the winner. Winner takes things as winning and losing based on a big picture. They like to make big decisions. They like to invest in the stock market. They like to you know, see whether something is successful or fails. Um, they can miss small details. They're not very detail-oriented. In the end, what matters to them is did it work or did it not work? The seeker. They're a strong leader. They're assertive. They're fast-paced and they push boundaries. These are like your startup CEOs, the people who really want to just launch into things and, and uh, lead a project to, to successful completion. Then there's a risk taker. They're really a gambler and an adventurer. They like adrenaline. Um, they're oftentimes bored in situations if things are not high pressure and moving fast and exciting. Um, they uh, do have the ability to be very overconfident about themselves and sometimes they make bad risk decisions. The enthusiast, so they're extroverted, they're really friendly, they're creative, they're artistic, they're a great networker, but they're oftentimes not a really good listener. Um, so they're, they're your social butterfly in a group who likes to associate with people, but they're mostly concerned about number one. You know the type, okay? The buddy, so the buddy tries to make everybody happy. They're that person who is really uncomfortable letting somebody down or telling somebody no or firing somebody because they wanna make everybody happy all the time. Okay, the other six, the collaborator. The collaborator is the person who walks into an angry team and tries to get everybody to get along. 
So when the team is arguing, they act, they act as the marriage counselor. They're the person who stops the argument and makes people compromise and, and tries to play diplomat in business situations. They're very supportive and very outgoing. The peacekeeper, they diffuse negative systems, but they're very, very calm. They're diplomatic and they're very risk adverse. So conflict to them is a risk. The technician is more introverted. So they're analytical, they're highly rational. They're sometimes inflexible. They, they are very thorough about processes and they're very calm. So they're mathematicians, things like that, engineers. Um, they like to work on calm, organized things. The bedrock's a person who just does whatever needs to be done on a team. You know, whatever needs to get done, they stay in the, in the background, they don't get noticed, and when things are broken, they fix them. Um, and they can be a little bit too introverted and humble. They don't get credit for a lot of the projects they do. Then there's the analyst. They are highly logical and detail-oriented. Another, like, scientist or mathematician type role. They're a perfectionist, and they're very, very focused on single tasks, so they can focus on something for a long time, like a project. And finally, we have the perfectionist. The perfectionist is the person, this is, this is me, the person who looks at a project and says what's gonna break. They're, they're a person, they can be blunt, they, can, they question everything when they come into a project as part of a team. They're like, hey, this isn't gonna work. I can see how this is gonna fail. Here's how this is gonna fail. And they're, they're usually the person who's seen as kind of negative because they, they take everything apart and say what's gonna break. So again, these are just some ways to look at your personality. Maybe you grabbed onto one of these or two of these and you said, that's kind of my personality. I'm just using them as a tool here. I'm not like a true believer in any of these models. Again, you can't put human beings in a box, but I'm gonna talk about some cybersecurity roles now. I'm gonna talk about some things you might be interested in doing in the future, right? And um, various niches that you can get into as a cybersecurity person, both on the blue team and the red team. And to do that, I'm gonna use these personality models and learning styles, these, uh, these different personality traits we talked about to talk about where you might be happy or unhappy because I'm not gonna just talk about what's really cool in the job. You can go on YouTube and watch 100 talks about why pen testing is neat, why you wanna break into buildings and rob banks. Oh my God, go, go watch Johnny Christmas's talks, holy cow. I mean, like, yeah, it's really, really cool, but there is 70% of that work you're not seeing in the YouTube talks for the most part. And it's the part that people, even people who really love the work might consider boring. And that's an important aspect to consider when you're deciding what job to take, right? What is the, the other 70% of the iceberg that I don't see in these talks all the time, that people aren't plugging to me, that my teachers aren't trying to sell me an expensive degree program on? Let's talk about them, okay? So first of all, this red team, blue team, purple thing. Okay, everybody in cybersecurity, hopefully, is trying to improve the defense of organizations. They just do it in different ways. All these niches I'm gonna talk about, they're all super important. And they all have an impact on the defense of an organization. And even if you are a pen tester, a red teamer, breaking into things, or you're doing exploit or vulnerability research, your end goal should be making people more secure, okay? So these divisions, they're kind of in the, the realm of work that you'll be in, but in the end, everybody has the same end goal, and that's to keep bad people, criminals, out of net networks and keep people's information safe, right? So the red team, they typically do this more offensively. This is your pen testers, your red teamers, your exploit researchers, etc. And they are doing things more like emulating the criminals to prevent the criminals from actually being successful. So let's go out and see how the criminals are doing things and see how it would work in this environment so that we can catch it before it actually happens. The blue team is the defenders. Um, so they're, they're kind of, they're doing the monitoring and the forensics and the you know, system configuration to try to defend the network. They're all in the end contributing to the defense of the organization. And that's all really, really important. They all have the same goal and they should all be working together. But they're kind of two different tracks for getting into cybersecurity. Now, let's talk about this purple team elephant in the room. Purple team, everybody should have exposure to both. You know, you should, if you're a blue teamer, dedicated lifelong blue teamer, you should shadow some pen testers sometime and see how they work. You'll learn a lot. I certainly have. I've learned a ton from this. It's awesome. And same with the red team. 
You're going to learn a lot about breaking into things to see where defenders screw up. You know, it's going to help you. So yeah, purple teaming is an important concept. And we should be working together because we are one team, one fight. However, to learn both of those things in great detail is incredibly difficult, nay, impossible. Um, you really can't, again, focus on more than one niche in, in, in huge detail, in great detail. There's just too much information. Our field is changing all the time. Each of our niches is changing all the time. So in the end, after we get out of generalist roles, we kind of have to focus a little bit. Um, and just some example roles for the two, and again, they are working together, they should be doing shadowing and overlapping, but, you know, your blue team is kind of, you start out as maybe a SOC analyst, that's kind of your entry-level defensive role, and you may, you may become something like an incident responder, or a malware reverser, or a security architect. You might even get into threat intelligence, if that's something that interests you. And on your red team side, you might become a junior pen tester as an entry-level role. Um, and then move into something like exploit research or red teaming, et cetera, et cetera. So there's multiple paths into these, but they kind of are their own skill trees or career trees. Something to think about as we continue. So let's start out with my job. So my job is digital forensics and incident response. So let's talk about what I do. So I'm a detective. When somebody gets hacked into, I'm the one who goes out and tries to figure out what happened forensically, build a timeline and a narrative of the, of the intrusion. So what's the story of how somebody got in and what they did? So really cool, right? That's, that's, it's cool work, it's interesting, it's engaging. You're trying to catch the adversary, find out what they did, and build this granular detailed timeline and story about how they got in and what they did and what impact that has on the environment. And my sales pitch here is, yeah, it's cool, you're a detective. You are performing an investigation from zero to understanding a full detailed picture that the adversary tried to hide of how the network was intruded into and what happened to the devices. So you are, you are doing an investigation, it's CSI stuff, it's pretty neat. And what's the downside of my job? All right, this is crisis management work. It's incredibly stressful for the person calling me in, and therefore it's incredibly stressful for me. Usually I'm walking into these situations where people are sweating bullets and the executives are screaming. Everybody's having their worst day ever. And what, what do people do when they're already stressed out? Well, they lash out at you. They're angry, they swear at you. Um, they don't wanna cooperate with you. They question everything you do. They don't trust anybody. They're, they're in a bad emotional state when I'm dealing with them already. I don't get to see them on their best day. I see them on their worst day. Um, that also means that there's a ton of sudden travel. Um, my job can mean having a bag by the door and being gone on an airplane with a few hours notice at any given time, even over the holidays. Um, there's a lot of hurry up and wait too. We, I talk about crises, but Crises don't necessarily mean I'm doing things constantly. It can mean I have to be on a plane right away, but then I have to sit there for eight hours because the person who's, who needs to let me into the building isn't there. And I get to sit there on my laptop and do nothing and just wait. And everybody's panicking and everybody's screaming, and there's nothing I can do for eight hours. Or maybe I have to wait for evidence to transfer or process or et cetera for, for several hours. So there's a lot of hurry up and wait in the job, and that can be incredibly stressful when you're already in a stressful crisis situation. So you have to be able to manage that level of stress and also being patient when you can't do anything. Um, sometimes you don't get a satisfying answer in my job either. You're doing detective work, and in the movies and in the TV shows and in the books, the detective always figures out what happened, and they have a clear story, and they know how the person got in and what they did, and it all wraps up neatly with a bow. That's not reality. In some cases, so much evidence has been lost or destroyed that there is no way to figure out who done it. And I have to walk away. I have to say to this level of confidence, this is what I can tell you and this is what I can't. And I have to be okay with never knowing the answer to the mystery. Um, so who might this work well for? Um, the analyst, the perfectionist, the risk taker, or the collaborator? Because we're in these high stress situations with people who we have to deal with in their most stressed out situation. You have to be good under pressure. You have to enjoy a mystery. And you also have to be a, a good investigator. So you have to be willing to follow the scientific method 
and you know, take time to build a detailed, evidenced timeline. So that takes time and that takes attention to detail. You also have to thrive in chaos because you are walking into crises day in and day out. Who may it not be for? Well, the technician, the peacekeeper, and the buddy. You have to make some people unhappy, and you have to deal with very, very unhappy people. If that's uncomfortable for you, if getting swore at and getting yelled at and having people cry in front of you makes you miserable, this is not gonna be the job for you. You have to walk in with confidence and tell people what they need to do, even if they're really pissed off. Um, if you're uncomfortable in high pressure crises, this is not the job for you. If you're not patient, this is not the job for you. If you're easily frustrated with human beings, this is not the job for you because again, tired people on their worst day ever who are very angry at nothing in particular or at the wrong targets. If you fail to recognize your own biases, you can't do the scientific method well and you can't do good investigations, it's not the job for you. And if you need your work-life balance, it's probably not the job for you because you might be working 48 hours straight on an investigation without going home. I have some quotes here from people for you, you all to enjoy. I ask people to tell me about the, the stuff they didn't enjoy in their work. But um, here we have a good one. Um, uh, I sometimes put the differ hat for serious enough incidents in my company. Truth is investigating things back to the initial access sometimes isn't what the customer wants. Most times they want enough to be sure that their environment is clean to get it back up and running. I absolutely agree with this. So this is uh, what I'm talking about. Sometimes you don't get a satisfying answer. And that is very frustrating if you like to investigate things. You have to be willing to live with that. Okay, let's move along to another fun role that a lot of people want to do, which is pen testing or red teaming. I'm going to combine some things together just for the sake of time here. So the job. Simulate an adversary to test the digital security of organizations and prevent real life crime. Um, so my sales pitch here is, wow, you get to hack into things. That's really cool. That's really fun. You are simulating the people who are committing crimes on the internet. And that means you get to break into boxes. You get to pop boxes. You get to get, you know, shell on boxes. It's really, really cool. Um, you know, you're finding stuff. You're, you're, you're you know, exploiting systems. You're moving from system to system. Maybe you get the domain controller. Wow. Wow, that's really fun. Let's talk about the mundane stuff, okay? Your job is in finally, in the, in the first place, improving security and celebrating your own losses. This is something a lot of young pen testers and red teamers don't get. When you lose and you can't get to the domain controller, that's a good day. That means that you have validated that the security of this organization is good against the tactics you used. Hey, that's awesome, you should be happy. I see a lot of people really unhappy about that because they didn't, they didn't get root in a box. So they were bad hackers, right? No, that's not the point. The point is to do a good test of the security and hopefully the organization doesn't fail it. Um, you have to explain to execs and manager how you got in. So, um, and also how to prevent it in the future. And you have to do that to multiple audiences. So, so execs, to managers, to technical people, you have to be explain, explaining to them how you got into these systems, what it means, how they can make risk decisions based on this, et cetera, et cetera. So multiple audiences here. You're not just talking to technical people. You might be talking to a CIO and you have to explain things in different ways to these different audiences and you have to be patient with them and answer their questions. That means a ton of report writing as well. Lots of report writing. Sometimes my pen tester buddies estimate 70% of their job is report writing to convey this information they found about the intrusion to the correct audiences to, again, improve the security. And sometimes the stuff you find will not be fixed by the time you come back again. So whether you're working internally or as a consultant, you might come back to the same organization a year later and this really huge thing that you thought was really important didn't get fixed for various reasons. So you have to be okay with that. You have to be willing to let it go, let it go, let it go. Um, so who might this work well for? Well, the winner, the analyst, the enthusiast, the perfectionist, the collaborator, or the bedrock. So a lot of different personalities can enjoy this work, either from an analytical standpoint or a creative challenging perspective. Uh, kinesthetic learners, this is very, very hands-on. Um, and uh, collaborative educators, people who like to teach people how to do better security, because that is such a huge part of your role as a pen tester or a red teamer. It's educating the defenders, 
the organization in how to do better security based on what you found. So if you enjoy that, if you're like, hey, I can teach them how to do better security, this might be the job for you. And creative problem solvers, you have to be very creative to do this job because you're trying to move from system to system, move laterally, get into different types of systems. So yeah, you need to, you need to think on your feet. So that's, that's great. Who might this not be for? Well, the buddy or the perfectionist, because again, sometimes you're gonna have to give people bad news, and sometimes you're going to have to let it go, like I mentioned, because you can't change things. If you're uncomfortable writing detailed reports, um, this is not the job for you, or presenting those reports to a variety of audience, this is not the job for you. If you have to win rather than help people, this is not the right job for you, okay? Um, if you have an emotional attachment to quantifiable success, so if you have to win, and the systems have to be fixed, and the security has to get better every single time you do a pen test, you are going to be sorely disappointed over and over and over and over again. So you need to be able to detach yourself from that. You cannot have an emotional investment in the things that you found in your pen test from last year being fixed when you come back the next year. It is a growing curve. There's a learning curve here. It takes time for organizations to fix their security flaws, and you are part of that process. You are helping them learn and build their security over time. I see, I've got some good ones up here. Um, pen testing and red teaming. Your job is not super cool Hollywood hacker. Sometimes a customer will do everything right and frustrate you at every turn. Your job is then to celebrate their victory uh, well, temp uh, tempering them against overconfidence and complacency. Yeah, so that, that was very, very, very well said. Um, a lot of interesting points here. Hacking stuff is mostly worthless in isolation. Improvement comes from leading the org on a journey. I love that as well. Again, you're thinking about the holistic picture here of improving cybersecurity, not just hacking into boxes. Threat intelligence. All right, so the job. Investigate and collate intel projects, uh, products on what adversaries are doing and how for use in everything from takedown efforts for malicious servers to detection. So what's the pitch here? You are investigating adversaries. You're getting ahead of them. You're finding out who they really are and what they do and how they do things. Um, you have gratifying moments of uncovering elusive adversaries. It's really meaningful work research that will be seen by people all over the world potentially or huge cybersecurity communities. It's really cool investigative work. Now, what's the, the boring part of this work? Well, it's very, very tedious. You're looking through tons and tons of data and you're trying to make useful Intel products out of it. So you're doing tons of data compilation as well. So you must have a very strong sense of perseverance and be very, very, very patient. You're not always, once again, going to get a conclusive answer. And again, you have to be willing to let that go. If you don't get a satisfying answer about what the adversary is doing or who they are, you might just not have the data available to you to make that determination. Um, everybody's gonna want attribution too, to like a country. And you will often not be able to provide that, and in a lot of cases, it's not wise for you to try to provide that. So you will have to tell people no to that type of thing a lot, even though you might have a good guess. So uh, cyber intel might work well for the technician, the bedrock, the enthusiast, or the analyst. It works really well for innovators. You have to be very creative. You have to go out there and put things together from zero to try to understand what adversaries are doing. You have to be very creative. And you have to be able to think outside of the box. You have to be willing to recognize your personal biases because you're doing, a, again, a scientific investigation. And it works well for visual or auditory learners. You're reading tons of stuff and potentially listening to tons of stuff as well. Um, you're going through lots and lots of data. And good technical writers, this is an amazing place for you because there is so much technical writing that goes into creating these Intel products. Who may it not be for? So the winner, the seeker, or the risk taker. This is arduous, painstaking, time consuming work. You have to be incredibly patient and you're not always going to get a satisfying conclusion. You aren't necessarily going to get a clear cut answer. And if you don't like to write or present, it's just pretty much a no go because you are going to be writing so much in, in Intel in general, various types of products and reports. 
If you're impatient with doing repetitive analytical work, it's not gonna be the place for you either. You're doing, again, tons of data handling. And you can't be the kind of person who is unhappy being wrong because you are eventually sometimes going to be wrong about things. Um, another good statement here, um, Alan says, not every threat in threat intelligence leads somewhere. You may, spend, you may spend a few days tracking an indicator doing weird things only to find out it's connected to a marketing tool that's been authorized and vetted. So there's leads that go nowhere and it's very tedious work, but it's very, very valuable and it's very important work for what everybody else does in cybersecurity. Okay, let's move on to security architect or engineer. So the job design and lead implementation of secure networks and security product deployments. So what's cool here? Well, you're the one building the security architecture. You're the one installing the tools. You're the one giving people the, the ability to monitor and to do incident response and to do forensics on the network. You're also building the defenses for the network potentially. So putting in firewalls, uh, putting in intrusion prevention, EDR, etc. So it's hugely impactful work. Um, it is also a relatively nine to five job. So I talked about an incident response, it's, there's not a lot of great work-life balance there. This is a job with great work-life balance. You get to go home at the end of the day for the most part, unless you get called out on some kind of emergency. Like this is a, a normal working office job. So what's the downside of this job? Um, the basics are really, 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 really hard. You have to understand how systems work together. You have to understand how to make them do what they need to do and tune them appropriately. Um, they're not widely implemented basics either, so you'll go into a lot of new environments and find out that the fundamentals aren't done and have to start from scratch. You might not be the final decision maker on what products you buy or where you put them. You might get overruled by executives or other, other leaders in your organization or your engineering team. And it's really kind of a thankless job too. When things are not broken and they are working as designed, people don't notice your, ex your existence. You know, it's just kind of one of those roles, like a lot of engineering roles, where people don't notice you exist until something goes catastrophically wrong and then they yell at you. So who might this work well for? Well, the analyst, the bedrock, or the technician. For those reasons I've described, it's, it's uh, you know, kind of a routine job where there's not a lot of notice. Adapters, so you've got to work with what's there, right? So if you're more comfortable adapting existing networks and systems to do what they need to do, um, this might be a great role for you because you have to think creatively about how to improve security. If you value long-term success and growth, if you can think about things in terms of years, um, that's, that's wonderful. Um, I like enabling colleagues. Again, this is a thankless job. So if you like making people able to do security better, even if they're not singing your praises every day, that's a great role for you. You are doing really important, meaningful work even if you don't get a bunch of recognition. Good tool developers and scripters, if you like to build stuff, this is a great role as well. So who might it not be for? Well, the risk taker, the challenger, this is, this is uh, you know, just not a, a job where you're gonna get a lot of recognition and you're gonna feel like you've accomplished something every day. You have to be able to think long-term about your success and be patient with it. Um, innovators, you're not necessarily gonna get to burn down your network and start from scratch. Um, if you hate scripting, it might not be the job for you either because you're gonna have to adapt a lot of tools to do new things. Um, you configure your tools, get them working right. You're gonna spend a lot of time at the command line. If you dislike gradual change, if you're impatient with people like users, it's gonna be frustrating work. And if you need to be in control of everything, well, I got news for you. You're not, again, not necessarily gonna be the final decision maker on everything. Oh boy, what do we have here? I work in cybersecurity architecture. Part of my job is to help teams design secure solutions. But too much of the time it seems to boil down to this conversation. Don't be stupid. I said, don't be stupid. Look, don't be stupid. Why were you stupid? Of course, I don't actually get to say that. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> All right. Malware reversing. All right. Do I have any malware reversers out there? I've got like two. Oh, good. Okay. Well, I'm going to tell you about it. All right. So the job. You take viruses, malware, apart to see what they do. So you disassemble them, you investigate them, and you understand their capacity, perhaps who made them, how they made them, and better ways to detect them. Um, 
the pitch here is, wow, you get to learn all about malware. You get to, it's a puzzle. You get to figure it out, figure out how malware strains are related to one another and what their capacity is, whether there's something new out there. Um, perhaps out with the authors, get detections and prevention measures, measures out there before the adversaries are able to do something. So what's the mundane here? Well, you have to know a lot about computer science and computer engineering. Um, that means like assembly. A lot of reverse engineering involves reversing things in assembly language. Um, and a lot of people do not enjoy doing that. So you're gonna constantly need to learn new coding, new programming languages, things like that to keep up with modern malware. Report writing skills, once again, we come back to these. You need to be able to report on all this malware you researched, and you need to make this stuff, this really technical computer stuff, comprehensible for dumb incident responders like me, um, so that we can understand what the malware does. So you need to be able to, again, write reports for multiple audiences, and you need a lot of focus, because you could be staring at the same malware, piece of malware, for days, weeks, maybe even months if it's something really noteworthy, um, and it has a hugely steep learning curve. Like, you have to know all this computer engineering or computer science stuff. You have to understand about how people build malware. You have to understand how to take it apart. And you have to keep this knowledge up to date. So big learning curve there. That's why they get paid the big bucks. And they do get paid the big bucks. Um, there's limited training out there, too, I'm relatively compared to other niches in cybersecurity. So who might malware reversing work well for? Well, the bedrock, the analyst, or the technician. You need that patience analytical mind. Innovators, you need to think about new ways to take malware apart all the time. You need to be very patient. You need to have good methodology. Um, you need to be a creative problem solver as well because you're gonna be dealing with people who try to confuse you and you know break your decompiler um, during your reverse engineering. They, the, the malware authors know you're there and they're gonna try to make your life hell. They're gonna write their code in confusing ways and they're gonna try to outwit you because they know you're gonna try to take apart their malware. So you're gonna need to like to, an intellectual challenge because everything's gonna be a puzzle and you're gonna be thwarted. And you need strong computer science skills, once again. You need to know a lot about how code works and how computers work and how pointers work, how assembly works. So who might it not be for? Well, the seeker of enthusiasts, no quick wins here. Um, visual learners, because again, you, uh, there's not a lot out there in terms of educational materials and you're gonna be reading a lot of code and a lot of books. If you're impatient or you're easily frustrated, this is not the role to get into. If you don't like lots of code or particularly purposefully messy code, this is not the job role for you. And if you don't like to write detailed reports about what you found that, again, dumb incident responders like me can understand, not the job for you. <laughs> Here's one. You're gonna, you're gonna write, you're gonna write a lot. You may believe writing is not why you got into this, but to be effective, you need to do it well. All the work you do is worthless if you can't effectively convey that work into actionable writing. Wow. And then somebody else commented, James commented, add two additional hours to whatever reversing you're planning. Two additional hours to the reversing work you do that day. Woo! Vulnerability management. So this is one that a lot of people think sounds boring, but it's actually really, really important. So discover, document, and manage patching or exceptions for vulnerable systems across the enterprise. Pitch here. Discover the reality of a network. What's really, really going on there, okay? Um, take that network from zero to hero. This is a nine to five job again. This is something you can do with work-life balance. Um, you're the one planning for patching systems, understanding what's vulnerable in your environment, et cetera, et cetera. The mundane, the fundamentals of cybersecurity often don't exist at all. And sometimes there's reasons they can't exist in your environment. Sometimes you don't have good asset inventory, so you don't know where the vulnerable systems are. So this job requires tenacity, empathy, and patience. Who might it work well for? The collaborator, the peacekeeper, or the technician? You have to work with people here. You have to be cooperative and you have to be patient. Analytical and organized people, adapters, people who valid, value projectized improvement and value work-life balance. Who's it not for? The winner, the risk taker, or enthusiast? This is, again, kind of a thankless job and it requires a lot of patience and working with people. It's not a great job for innovators. You're trying to fix things. It's not good if you're inflexible, and it's not good if you're impatient in general. 
And if you're easily frustrated with people not doing what you want or what you hope for, you're going to be really, really unhappy. So here, what we got. Um, vulnerability management. The worst, time is, the worst part is trying to find ownership on systems that don't show up in the asset inventory. It's usually maintenance interfaces. Trying to sort out who maintains what through load balancers is a hoot, too. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of frustration on this one. Um, all right, governance, risk, and compliance. Another important job that people don't think about a lot. So quantify risk and guide decision-making in your organization around cybersecurity risk. And that can involve security policy and budgets, et cetera. So really important stuff, but kind of behind the scenes. So the decision-maker for what you spend on cybersecurity and where you put it and what people you get and how you train them and what risk you're willing to accept as an organization, and if you're in compliance with various standards. And this is important. You get to be a key decision maker to ensure the company makes the best security decisions possible. You're doing a really important thing, and it's once again got work-life balance. This is nine to five work. What's the boring part? Well, you're reading a whole bunch of compliance stuff and regulations, and they can be arcane. I mean, read like PCI stuff, oh my god. And the, the other really negative part here is the orgs will think they're secure because they check the box and you're like, no, no, you're not secure. It's not, PCI doesn't cut it. And they don't care because they check the box and their lawyers are happy and their insurers are happy. You'll have to deal with lots of contracts and you'll have to deal with lots of politics and be a good politician to get what you need. It might work well for the challenger, the collaborator, the peacekeeper, or the bedrock. It's great for adapters. It's great for people-focused people. If you're a people person, this might be an amazing role for you because you're good at negotiating. Creative problem solvers, absolutely. Work with the budgets you've got. And valuing work-life balance. Who's it maybe not for? The risk taker, the seeker, the buddy, or the perfectionist. This is a thankless job. It's a cooperative job, and it requires patience and ability to work with people. Innovators, inflexible people. People who get impatient with people or processes. People who are uncomfortable making hard calls. What do you got here? <laughs> Holy crap, I forgot about contract negotiations. I think that's more of a GRC thing. Thankfully, that's not part of my regular job. I've asked people on a call before, can you just come to my house and shoot me down, please? <laughs> I, I, I understand. I understand. <laughs> yeah, contract negotiations. Yeah, that's part of GRC. Sorry, guys. AppSec and product security. The job? See, you are the bridge between the people who make things, widgets, products, software, and cybersecurity. That's really, really, really important. We can all agree that having password 00, zero dot on everything that we buy is kind of not great, but it happens. And you could be that person who finally makes all those smart home devices, this Internet of Things things, or the software you buy actually secure. That's awesome. That's a huge project for the entire world right now. All right, so what's the downside here? Well, first of all, budgets are king in a lot of these environments. And that relationship between the developers or the engineers and cybersecurity can be super hostile. So this requires a delicate touch and a good negotiator. Everything involves creating and tracking documentation as well because you're part of the engineering process. So it might work well for the peacekeeper, the buddy, the collaborator, um, adapters as well, because you're again trying to work with an existing thing and make it better. Good diplomats and negotiators. And people who have a strong understanding of product development life cycles, whether that's building physical widgets or software development. It might not be for the risk taker, the winner, or the perfectionist. It might not be for innovators. It might not be for anybody who's a poor people person. People who are not okay with compromise, you will need to make a lot of compromises in this role. And if you're uncomfortable negotiating, this is not going to be the role for you. You need to do a lot of negotiating to get the security you can, the best security you can for the budget, implemented in this software or the widgets, etc. All right. <laughs> role, product security or AppSec. Boring part, chasing tickets. You generate work that another team needs to do to increase our security and reduce risk in a ticket. But then you actually have to track that ticket and make sure they actually do it. Multiply that one ticket by 100 or so. Ooh, okay. Physical pen testing. Ooh, this is a sexy job everybody wanted to hear about. Everybody's like, yeah, I heard all these cool stories about physical pen testing. Oh my god, these are the people who break into buildings. They get to rob banks. 
So they test the security of an organization by physically intruding into their facilities to conduct, uh, to conduct objectives, whether that's getting into a computer system or just getting into the building. The pitch is easy here, guys. You get to break into buildings. Oh my god, you get to sneak your way in. You get to be a ninja. You get to pick locks. You get to crack safes. Oh my god. Okay, let's talk about the boring part of this really, really sexy, cool job, okay? Um, first of all, you can potentially get somebody fired in this job very, very easily. If you social engineer somebody to let you into the building and they're not supposed to, you're going to put their name on the report. That's just how it works. And they might get fired unfairly because of that. And then that's going to be... I mean, it's not on you, it's not your decision in the end, but you may feel like it is your decision in the end. You may feel responsible for that emotionally. Um, there's still a ton of report writing. Again, that 70% of the, the job is report writing. You don't succeed unless you're helping improve security. So just breaking in doesn't cut it. Again, your job is to make the security of the organization better. And if you're failing at conveying change and improving security as a result of what you've done, you are failing. So you need those good report writing skills and the ability to teach and convey information. It's not as glamorous as you think. And I've got some good quotes on this one about how unglamorous it can actually be sitting outside in the sun or the rain trying to get into a building. And there's a high likelihood you're going to end up in jail temporarily. Yes, you'll have your get out of jail free card, but in reality, people are going to take you to jail before they start looking for paperwork. So you can definitely, and it's happened, there's been some high profile cases in the news. Um, the, the, where people spent substantial amounts of time in jail as pen testers who were completely authorized breaking into buildings. So it might work well for the risk taker, the seeker, the enthusiast, or the perfectionist. It's a great job for innovators, kinesthetic learners, you're always hands on, you're cracking safes, you're breaking into locks, things like that. Good social engineers, this is the job for you, man, you're going to get to talk your way into buildings. If you're, you're a good used car salesman, this is a job for you. Strong physical security skills. You've got to be able to break into stuff and understand how locks work and understand how doors work and things like that. It might not be for people like the buddy, the collaborator, the peacekeeper, or the bedrock. You've got to trick people and you can get them in a lot of trouble. You've got to be comfortable lying to people. You've got to be comfortable manipulating people. And for a good cost, too. It's not going to be a good job if you're impatient. You're going to have to do a lot of waiting to get into buildings or to get what you need out of an organization. Poor presenters or report writers, again, you are not going to accomplish anything. If you're uncomfortable manipulating people, if you're uncomfortable getting caught and having to face some temporary consequences, if you're uncomfortable being uncomfortable, God, these quotes, I've got so many of them from these people. Uh, um, sitting outside in the, in the rain in Anorak, waiting desperately for a particular client with a weak signal in a server room somewhere to connect to the corporate Wi-Fi, trying to look inconspicuous for half a day. That sounds horrible. That sounds awful. Um, I always thought this job was really sexy, and then I, I got to read all these quotes about being stuck in the sun and the rain and waiting for people and not being able to pee and things because they're waiting for their opportunity to get into a building. And you don't see that part in the movies. They don't show the part where they, they, don't, they can't go pee for four hours because they're trying to follow somebody. They're trying to shoulder steer somebody. Um, finally, exploit bug and vulnerability research. So the job is research things to find means for exploitation. Disclose with the vendor and security firms. So you are the rock star who uncovers meaningful bugs and how they can be exploited, hopefully ahead of the adversaries. It can be very well paid. And it can also be self-employed, self-paced. What's the downside of this work? Bug hunting, exploit research, vulnerability research. Well, there's lots of writing because you have to, the only way you're going to get paid is if you write up these bugs and vulnerabilities well, at least the very meaningful ones. Sometimes you'll be ignored. Sometimes people won't listen to you. Sometimes you'll be scooped by another researcher and they'll get the bounty or the glory and not you. And it's not glamorous for the majority. There's a ton of people who do this and only a, a small number, relatively, are incredibly famous and successful. It might work well for the winner, the seeker, the analyst, or the perfectionist. You have to work hard, you have to be willing to take risks, you have to be willing to persevere. Um, visual and kinesthetic learners, um, you have to be flexible. You have to have strong research and computer science skills, both of those. So you have to both be able to investigate things having to do with computers and understand at a very rudimentary level and very fundamental level how computers are engineered and how they work. 
It might not be for the peacekeeper or the technician because this is not necessarily study work. It's not necessarily always glory-based work. And if you don't like writing detailed reports, it won't be a happy job for you. If you're overly invested in visible success, you might be going into this job for the wrong reasons. Because again, the vast majority of people in these roles are not the big names that you see producing the really, really famous stuff. A lot of people work for years at bug bounty hunting and just make a, a basic living on it. They're not making millions. Um, if you want study work and income, especially like the, the self-employed work here is not necessarily reliable. You have to be bold and you have to be working hard. Um, so Reed says, embedded system security testing, hot. Doing the bug hunting, not writing the report. The first part definitely requires creative thinking and rapidly or wild, wildly testing theories. The second requires thoroughness and attention to detail. They're very different brains. You have to have both of those things to succeed in that, in that area. So in summary, I, Leslie, cannot, Auntie Leslie cannot tell you for sure what job you'll enjoy. I can't tell you what personality type you are. I can give you some clues about what you might not like and what sounds interesting. I tried to give you a little bit more of the negative because there's, you could go out on YouTube and watch a hundred security talks about any one of these niches and see how cool they are. But I wanted to give you a little bit of the stuff we don't see in those talks so you can make a better decision. What I can suggest now is go explore. Find out more about the fields that stood out to you today. Watch talks about them. Try to shadow those job roles. I think that you will find a niche that you enjoy if you take the time to really explore these and figure out what's going to work for you. If you want to reach out to me, um, I'm Hacks for Pancakes on all the various social things. Feel free to reach out. I'm happy to chat with people as my schedule allows. I also have a public Gmail. It's hacksforpancakes at gmail.com. Shoot me an email. I'm happy to talk. I have a website with a bunch of blogs on it that you might find useful. It's called tosiphony.net. And I run a conference, uh, it's a virtual conference every year called Pancakes Con. Our talks are up on YouTube. Uh, stop by Career Village and see me while you're here. I am doing a, uh, interviews and resume reviews. Uh, hopefully some of you find that useful. It was a pleasure to speak with you all. Any questions? No questions. Cue applause.